Welcome to High Lawn Baptist Church in St. Albans, West Virginia, where our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known. We pray that you are blessed by the sharing of God's truth for us this day. For more information, visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. This is something that's over the course of, of this Sunday and the next couple of Sundays that's been on my heart. And I don't know who this message is for, but it's one that I couldn't shake. Um, it's one that actually drove me away from my previous series. So please pay attention to this into the next couple of Sundays. In fact, we're going to do something a little off bulletin. Um, the topic that we're going to cover is that God accepts us regardless of our past, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the things that we heap upon ourselves. In fact, it's, it's, it's a lie from the enemy that says, I'm not good enough, that I don't belong in church, that I have to straighten myself up first before I can participate that I'm not worthy of salvation, that the things I've done in my past, God will surely never accept me. Now that's a falsehood perpetuated by the enemy himself over countless generations of Christians. God doesn't place restrictions on his love. Who, who is unworthy of love? If we look at someone's appearance, are there certain characteristics that make us want to walk away from that person? If we examine someone's conduct, uh, are there quirks or habits or maybe mistakes from their past that we've kept a mental checklist of that threaten the value of that person in our eyes? Does that person slip habitually into trouble that they can never seem to get out of, that make us see them as, as lesser? Does someone who gets the occasional speeding ticket warrant more of our consideration than someone who's committed robbery? What would God say of these things? Does God place one sin over top of another? Does he condemn some things and just kind of overlook other things? Turn with me in your copy of God's Word to James 2. James chapter 2, starting with verse 8. The brother of Christ writes to us, starting with verse 8, if you really keep the royal law or the law of God found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. What he's saying is you can't put a reservation on love and get away with it. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles on just one point is guilty of breaking what of it? All of it. So how many sins does it take to condemn someone's soul to hell? How many unconfessed, unforgiven sins does it take for a person outside of the body of believers, outside of Christ, how many sins does it take for that person to suffer condemnation? One. Break one, you've broken it all. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. If Christ is our example, the model life we have to live up to in order to earn our, our own way into heaven, the standard by which we live our lives, if it's solely lived under our own power, we should approach God always in a state of fear and trembling because not only would we have be would we have to be found blameless under God's law outwardly? But we also have to remember that we're also judged by our thoughts and our motivations. If you look at someone that is not your husband or your wife longingly, then you have committed adultery where? In your own heart. This is still sin. Even though there's no outward act, it's still sin. 
So God judges not only what you do, the things you commit, but he also judges the motivations, the thoughts, the entertainments of our minds. It's often said that that's the battlefield between us and the enemy, a war of the heart. If it's impossible for sin to enter God's presence and the only alternative is an eternity, (laughs) the only alternative to an eternity with God is an eternity without God, we already stand condemned. Our actions alone, not just murder, theft, and adultery, but lying, disobedience, idolatry, if one sin is all it takes, then our actions alone are enough to warrant our condemnation. If you add sinful motivations on top of that, things like pride, greed, laziness, lust, envy, anger, hatred, we don't stand a chance. No life lived under its own power can ever measure up to the sinless life led by Christ. None of us can do it on our own. Sin is not merely a mistake in behavior, as some people suppose it to be. It's not just a a misstep that we can take back or be undone by good deeds. It's not a balancing act. Sin is open rebellion against God. Remember that you are created in the image of God. When we read, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He's not just talking about your vocabulary. He's talking about ambassadorship. When you who hold the image of God as part of you being, do something, think something, become something outside of him and his will, taking his name with you, you make vain the name and the reputation and the integrity of the God who created you. The gods whose image you bear. See, sin in God's eyes is a person trying to pass themselves off as their own God. Making an idol out of themselves. We call things like little white lies. Things that we consider easily forgivable. Things that we consider not worth the notice or the attention of others. But we forget that nothing escapes the notice and attention of God. There's an old song that says God keeps a record. He does. Because sin isn't just a matter of behavior. Sin is a matter of your love for the person who created you and his sovereignty in your life. We often think of it as something that's easy to get away with and buy with, but it's not. Sin is a disease, is a poison that we allow into our own souls that if untreated will consume us. Again, there's only one alternative to heaven. Why then would we have any hope? What makes any one of us able to think of eternity as anything besides a sense of self-loathing and desolation? If God is both judge and example automatically condemns us, holding an exhaustive list of our wrongs in his hands, with perfect memory, what is left? I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Let's start with verse 7. This is oddly translated into English, so I'll try to clear it up for us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. That's misrendered, what it, what it should actually say is more along the lines of it's, it's, it's incredibly rare for someone to give their own life up for someone, let alone for a good person. Even though for a very good person they might be tempted. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still yet sinners, What? Christ died for us. Being a people in rebellion, being a people who had nothing good for the kingdom of God, being a people who only bore the image of God and made desolate the image of God, even though we were still yet sinners, God loved us and loved this world so much that He sent His only begotten Son. God made flesh incarnate to this world for the express purpose of dying for us. 
so that that exhaustive list of gods would be justified and through that justification would be made blank. We have this misconception, I believe, that God will, at the end of our life, show us this, this reel of all of our deeds, this, this magical movie where we see everything, including our sins. Folks, God's for, God has forgiven you. Take the film out of the camera and expose it to his light. Your sin is no more. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were still God's enemies... Not just people that couldn't behave themselves properly, but God's enemies. That's how he defines sin. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation, a blank record. As far as the east is from what? The west. Sin hath blessed the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. If anyone had caused not to offer people forgiveness, it was God. Yet after all his creation had done to rid themselves of his authority... After all that we did to try to make ourselves into our own gods, he still sent Christ to die for us. A perfect person, not just good, not just righteous by our standards, but perfect, meaning Christ. Perfect in faith and faithfulness to the expectations of God. Perfect in love, both loving God and loving all those created in his image. The perfect sacrifice to bring all the lost and rebellious people of the world back into a right relationship with God. This is the overwhelming degree of God's love for each and every one of you. Nothing held back. One more time. Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 23. Galatians 3.23, before the coming of this faith, we were held under the custody of the law. Paul is writing about the difference between the law of Israel and the law of Christ. The difference between a law that condemns and a law that forgives. The difference between a millstone that we have to hold around our necks to a covenant of freedom where we not only become like Christ, but we become a new creation altogether. Before the coming of the faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come and would be revealed. So the law was our guardian, our schoolmaster in many of your translations, until Christ came, that we might be justified by what? So it's not works. So it's not good deeds. So it's not a balancing act where our sin's on one side of the scales and our good stuff is on the other side of the scales. When we talk about forgiveness, we talk about total forgiveness. We talk not about something you have to earn yourself out of, but something that has already been done for you. Not to work because we, not to work to be saved, but because we have been saved. And in our desire, having been saved, to see others come to Christ as well. The fruit of a Christian is more Christians. It's not good enough. To stay in the pew Sunday after Sunday. Our mission is to let other people know that there's a God out there. And this is the overwhelming depths of his love. It is by faith alone. Now that that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is now neither Jew nor Greek, Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither, nor is there male and female. For you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are of Abraham's seed, Abraham's family, the family of God. 
and heirs according to the promise. All the labels, all the restrictions, all the condemnation, the eternity of the wrath of God was poured out onto this one perfect person. The anger and justice that should have been visited upon us, demanded of us, was taken on by Christ. The promise God offered through Abraham, blessing for all nations, all people, came through Christ. A complete forgiveness that exposed all the wrongs, erased all the lists, forgave every trespass. If you are in Christ, you stand forgiven and you stand a member of the family of God, no ifs, ands, or buts. You stand as brothers and sisters of one great family, forged through the blood of our Savior, saved from desolation, united in the Holy Spirit of God. You may have many last names, but we are one in Christ Jesus. One hope, one faith, one baptism, one Lord and Savior of all, one family of God. There is no restriction in who this forgiveness is offered to. There are no boundaries of wrongdoing that are not overcome in Christ. While we hold to the truth that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we also know that God himself still loved his creation enough to look beyond our faults and find our need. For God so loved the world, even though they didn't deserve it, even though they didn't earn it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, say it with me, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting. This is a complete forgiveness that brings a complete restoration. There are no qualifications for it, no works required in order to receive it. Only faith, all shame, all indignation, it's all gone, replaced with love. All of the back guilt of the past that so often keep people from accepting the gift of grace is a lie from the enemy and who doesn't want you to be rescued for an eternity in torment. If anyone wants a relationship with God, if anyone desires the means to shake off the brokenness that keeps their life in turmoil, if anyone wants to lay behind the fear and pick up hope, God is here for you and is freely available to anyone that would accept him. I don't know who this message is for. I don't know the state of the hearts before me, only what I have seen. I know this. There's only one unpardonable sin ever recorded in Scripture. Only one thing that would permanently separate someone from God. And that's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now what is that? The Holy Spirit is the means by which we are connected to God. He is the, he is, he is the person of the Godhead who gives us direct access to God. To say no to him. To say no to the free offer of salvation. To say no to God. And to say no, and to say no, and to say no, and to say no. Eventually that invitation will be withdrawn. The only unpardonable sin is to say no more to God. To ask him to go away. To ask his presence to depart from you. We're going to go a little bit off script. I'm going to ask for a hymn of invitation as the musicians come forward. If there are any among us that have yet to come to know that free pardon of sin, what a beautiful day it would be to be the day of someone's salvation. 
if someone is struggling with a joy that has dropped away from their life, one that is theirs by birthright as a member of the family of God, the altar is open to you. If there is a sin that someone is struggling with and having trouble being able to lay down, something that has become a compulsion of their life, let them come forward and receive God's love. If there is someone that has been struggling about needing a spiritual home who have been, has been wandering away from needing the embrace of God's family, this, let this be the hour. But whatever the need on any heart is, whatever the need, come forward now. Do not say no to the Holy Spirit of God for another instant. Come forward. Have the matter settled once and for all and claim that which God offers you. So Heavenly Father, as we dedicate this time to you, we ask that if there are any here that do need you in their life, that need the reassurance of their salvation, that need to be held by your family, let them know that there's no restriction. Let them know that there is no bounds between you and them, nothing that you're unwilling to cross to embrace them. There is nothing greater than this, that no matter the sin, you set Christ for us so that all we have to do, all that we need to do, is hear his call and receive him. Draw, close to the, draw those close to you who you will and let them know and celebrate the God who loves them. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us at Highlawn Baptist Church. We pray that you were blessed by today's message. We believe that when you love God, you share his word. And when you love others, you spread the gospel. We hope that you're planning on joining us again next time and would love for you to join us in person. To learn more or to donate to our ongoing ministry, please visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Once again, thank you, and may God bless you and keep you.